is Eritrea. Now let's go, shall we? Eritrea's beginnings are as shadowy as every other land, but far-flung antiquity is a bit better documented here than in many other places, thanks to the cave-based pictorial efforts of the ancients who dwelt here. Centuries passed, and Eritrea became part of the land of Punt that so fascinated the Egyptians. Female pharaoh Hatshepsut famously funded a trip here by boat to trade around 1469 BC. Here we see some Puntite myrrh trees acquired for transplanting into the soil back home. Relations between Egypt and Punt appear to be good, and trade continued between the two kingdoms for quite some time. As Punt declined, other states arose in Eritrea, such as Darmut, with cities and iron technology to aid their agricultural efforts. Then a big change happened. Semitic speakers from the south of Arabia crossed the Red Sea into Eritrea, and their language, written script, and culture would come to permeate the country. From around the 1st century AD, Eritrea and northern Ethiopia formed the powerful kingdom of Aksum, situated in a commercially ideal spot, linking trade from India to the Mediterranean. And while the Aksumite capital was in what's now Ethiopia, the chief port city, Adlis, was in Eritrea, and for centuries was a busy harbour, lively with the exchanging of gold and spices and slaves. Christianity became the national religion in the 4th century, and to this day it remains the majority faith of Eritrea. Aksum expanded its territory via military conquest, but it was war that also caused its decline, particularly its late 6th century wars with Persia. The 7th century saw the dawning of Islam, and early Muslims fled Arabia to Eritrea, and the Christians sheltered them. Today, Islam is the second biggest religion in Eritrea. As Muslims gained control of the Red Sea region, the Aksum kingdom's decline accelerated, as it lost its crucial crux of commerce. However, the Christians regained the region in the 1400s with the Madra Bahri kingdom. Over the centuries, they fought several times with the Ethiopians, as well as the Somalis, and sometimes formed alliances with one or the other. But despite being great fighters, they could not prevent the steady incursion of the Italians, wanting to join the colonial endeavour like other European states, as well as cash in on the Red Sea trade opportunities. The Italian occupation saw rapid modernization with construction of railways, cableways, and Art Deco gas stations, and the later imposition of Mussolini's fascism. Eritrea was liberated by the British in World War II, but the Allied powers didn't really know what to do with Eritrea, which was religiously divided and had bad blood with its neighbours. Yet, in 1950, the UN handed it to Ethiopia, which many Eritreans didn't like. So they began fighting for independence, which they won after Eritreans defeated Ethiopian forces in 1991, becoming a sovereign nation in 1993. Then things simmered down for a while in our great another war. This was a bloody border dispute that really didn't change anything, and left tens of thousands dead. Subsequent years saw more skirmishes over disputed bits of ground. War's expenses are typically astronomical, and while freshly independent Eritrea had been doing well, all that ended with the colossal cost of conflict. Eritrea today is, as it essentially was in 1993, a dictatorship, and has a poor human rights record and a low human development index rank. And they make school kids wear pink shirts? I mean, come on, that's...